Hey, I cannot start this episode with my usual positive excitement. We are in a bedrock jail. These blocks cannot be broken. Somebody imprisoned us here. Oh my, oh my god, there, there he was. How do we get out of here? You know what? In the first episode, we figured out that we can teleport through roofs by manipulating the game's position packets. So let's use our proxy to escape. Hmm. But turns out it doesn't work. The server world I'm playing on is an online server and with the proxy implementation from Quarry, we cannot log in. That's a bummer. But you know what? I have another idea. During our first day, we came across a cave and there was an enderman and I killed him and he dropped an ender pearl. Ender pearls are very cool items because you can throw them and wherever they land, you teleport to it. It's like Minecraft has a teleport hack built in. And due to my Minecraft addiction, I've watched too many Minecraft YouTube tutorials and there is actually a glitch in the game where when you just have the right angle, when you throw an ender pearl, you can glitch through blocks. Let's try it. Yeah, it worked. Oh no, 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 oh, no, 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 we are dead again. I guess there was a firewall deployed. Oh man, this is bad. Now we don't have an ender pearl to escape anymore. But I don't give up. I have an idea. Let's see. I need a pickaxe and maybe a shovel. And luckily I just had enough iron to make another pickaxe. So I was thinking, the house had missing walls and the walls are now bedrock. So when they added the bedrock, maybe they forgot the floor? Let's see. Oh, looks like they started to or tried to play some bedrock, but it clearly is not complete. Looks like my theory is correct, we can just dig down and escape. I don't know, I guess there's a sandbox jailbreak metaphor here. The implementation just forgot one important attack surface. We found it broke out. Also, I wanted to go caving anyway, so let's look for some iron, coal and diamonds. My mood is already increasing again. After a bit of digging, I hit a first cave, nice. Looks like up there is another entrance for it, but let's go deeper. And there is the first creeper. Looks like I'm rapping, no problem, I'm attacking. No, 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 Let, let's stop that. I quickly found coal and started to mine as much as I can. And of course, I also found iron. We are still high enough for those ores. As you probably know, in the new update, coal only generates higher up and not deep down anymore. And of course, we keep running into other mobs. The skeleton even had an enchanted bow. Unfortunately, it didn't drop it for me. Keep mining, coal, 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 iron, 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 and keep killing mobs. Eventually, I reach a depth where the stone changed to deep slate, which means we are slowly getting into diamond territory. But ooh, found some gold and copper. It's good to have copper and gold, but it's not that important. Iron and of course diamonds are a lot more interesting for me right now. Though actually redstone is also awesome. Redstone is basically the electricity of Minecraft and we definitely need more of it to build automatic farms in the future. I also came across some lapis lazuli, which we need for enchanting our tools later. Ooh, down there is some lava and water. That should be a good depth to find diamonds. Oh, over there. There we have diamonds, but first we have to take care of the zombie. My diamonds, go away. This is going well. We found our first diamonds. I continued looking for more and eventually stumbled into this amethyst geode. Nice to bring some of that back up as well. And by the way, the blocks where the crystals grow, they look a bit different. We want to expose all sides of them because then we increase the amount of crystals growing. Later, we can come back and harvest even more. Cool. You know, the whole time while I was looking for the ores, I kept thinking about cheating. And I'm really curious how you think about it. So let me share some thoughts and then comment below what you think. So we looked at the protocol and figured out how to manipulate packets. And with that, we were able to teleport through roof blocks. I guess most people would say, yeah, this was game hacking. But at the beginning of this episode, we used an in-game item, Ender Pearl, threw it in a specific angle and glitched through the roof, essentially teleporting through the roof as well. Even I called this a glitch and not a hack, but is it also cheating? Using Ender Pearls for glitching through bedrock roofs, for example, to go on top of the nether roof, it is generally seen as a trick to use in the game and I don't get the feeling that the community sees that as really cheating. 
Though still, I don't think that this behavior of Enderpearl is really intended. It can be seen as a coding mistake that gets exploited. And by the way, I love game glitches, bending the rules of the system, finding behaviors the original developers did not intend and exploiting them. That's 100% the spirit of hacking. And glitch speedruns are my favorite category. But yeah, there's still something different between using technical solutions like manipulating game packets versus abusing something in game. I guess most people have an intuitive feeling that one is worse than the other. And I'm sure most people would say packet manipulation is definitely cheating. But with the Ender Pearl, I expect there to be a much bigger divide. I'm sure some say it's cheating and others say it's not. And so this depends on what your definition of cheating is. But now let's think about mods, client mods. Right now I'm playing with Optifine. It's a graphics optimization mod which makes everything look just a bit nicer. It can be used to get crazy graphics, but I just like to tweak it every so slightly so that it still feels like original Minecraft. But it also enables light from torches held in my hand. Usually these caves around me would be very dark if I don't place down the torches, but this mod illuminates everything around me. It makes sense I'm holding the torch in my hand, maybe it fixes a shortcoming of the original game, but the original game doesn't have it. So maybe this goes against the spirit of the game, and thus it is cheating? I think it totally depends on how strict your definition of cheating is. And of course, you can extend this. What about adjusting the brightness in the game settings? I guess that's still technically the game, but what about the brightness of your monitor? That's a technical outside solution. Though I guess seeing better in the dark is not that bad, but what about building? Minecraft is about building and the game has certain rules about it. So what about mods that help you build? There are mods where you can import a build as a wireframe and it shows you where you have to place the blocks or which blocks are wrongly placed. Clearly it's modifying the gameplay and displaying information that usually is not there. Many big Minecraft builder YouTubers use that for builds. Is that cheating? Hmm. What about X-ray mods that help you find diamonds easily? I think many regular players don't like X-ray mods and consider it cheating. But from a technology point of view, it works exactly the same. Building mods read the state of blocks around to figure out which blocks are placed right or wrong and X-ray mods need to know the blocks around to find the diamond ores. And then the building mod manipulates the game rendering to display that information coloring the blocks for the build instructions while X-ray mods hide stone to only show the diamonds. I think this example shows you that cheating cannot be defined really with the arguments about the technology used. You obviously cannot say because you manipulated packets or client code it's cheating. This means cheating is more about what you actually do with your manipulations. The actions in the game, that is what matters. And that's where people draw lines differently. When is it just a nice utility? When is it cheating? And when is it hacking? There is no answer where we all agree. And so there might be servers and game modes where blueprints of buildings is cheating, but I'm sure there are also servers where X-Ray is not really cheating because it's just allowed. So whether your actions are bad and malicious and whether you cheated or not depend a lot on the context and often it's up for debate. So what do you think? Also, I want to mention that I love Minecraft gameplay. Just because I can cheat doesn't mean I want to. I mean, I'm the admin of the server. Anytime I could use the Minecraft console to give myself 100 stacks of diamonds. But I don't do that. I'm down here mining. I want to play the game in a certain way. And cheating in that way would ruin the game for me. So I intentionally choose to not do that. And I want to remind you of what I said in the first episode. Because I don't want to ruin my own game, you should respect how others want to play the game as well. Don't cheat where it negatively influences others. Don't be an asshole. And as you can see here, you can cheat in your own game to learn and make up your own adventure without bothering anybody else. Anyway, speaking about cheating, we just learned that client mods can be used for cheating. 
I guess we should look into them. Though I have no clue how to write my own mods, so of course I just went on YouTube and looked for some tutorials. I ended up setting up the fabric example mod in IntelliJ, just create a new project from version control with the GitHub URL, and then we have to wait for a bit to Gradle to do its magic. Here's the folder structure, you can find an example mod main and an example mixin. This mixin is printing an example line. Let's test it. In the Gradle menu under fabric we have a run client. This will compile our mod and then launch an offline client. You can ignore the authentication error and go back to the actual log output. And eventually Minecraft started and we see our line printed. So what do we do now? I thought we have used a proxy to look at packets before. So let's try to write a mod that can print all the packets. Of course I'm not familiar with writing Minecraft mods at all. So I have to find a place to copy and paste code from. And to be honest, maybe I looked at this shulker dupe mod and stole some code from there. This is an interesting exploit and maybe we look at it closer another time or feel free to analyze it yourself. It's good practice. It's the same in normal IT security. It always is very educational to understand existing or even fixed vulnerabilities. This way you build a foundation so you later can create your own stuff. And this code is actually pretty clean and easy to understand, so for me to learn how Minecraft hacking works, to be able to write my own code, it was really helpful to look at this project. Anyway, in there I found a client connection mixin, which seems to be related to sending packets, so I took that as a starting point. The red class names have to be imported, IntelliJ helps us with that, and I rip out the packet code here that I don't need. Instead, I just want to print the name of the packet that is going to be sent. To add this new mixin to the mod, we have to go into the mixins JSON file and register it. And then we can execute run everything. It takes a moment for Minecraft to start, and then I join my local test server, and see in the console we are printing a lot of position and look packets. It works. This is the same information we also had from our proxy. And so I have a question. When you saw the first episode where we looked at the Minecraft traffic with a proxy, was that hacking? If yes, does that mean writing this basic fabric mod is also hacking? Well, the lines are blurry. That's my whole point. Anyway, when I was looking at this code the first time, I was wondering, what does mixin mean? And how does it work that apparently this code is somehow injected into the client connection class? Let's look at the class. So this is a class from the Minecraft game and IntelliJ decompiled it for us. Here is the send method. Hmm. But how does this work? How does our send method get called or apparently injected into it? I don't understand. It seems to have to do with this mixing stuff, right? So let's just read the code. That's how we learn, right? With control and clicking on a class, we can go there, inject, but it's just like this interface stuff. There's no actual code there. Maybe this add class is more useful? Hmm, it does say here something about opcodes, but still no actual implementation. Maybe it is this mixing class here itself? Also, no clue. Hmm. Tell me, what are you doing? Where is your code? So from what I understand just by using it here, this mixing stuff, I would maybe have called hooking. I mean, I'm coming from another area of IT security or game hacking and from my past experience, I would have called this hooking. Somehow we hook this send method and so when I replace mix in in my head with hooking, this code looks less scary to me. I understand that mixin has some kind of meaning why it's called mixin, but to me it's hooking. I don't care, I call it hooking. Anyway, I continue my quest trying to figure out how they do it. Mixin seems to be part of SpongePower. So I joined their Discord and asked questions and shout out to Silk and Mumfrey and some others on the Discord. They answered lots of my questions and helped me understand it. And it turns out Mumfrey is the magician behind Mixins. This person is crazy. You will understand in just a moment why. Anyway, they also pointed me at some resources to read. First of all, there is this fabric mixin tutorial, which has some very basic examples what you can do with mixins. If you specify inject into the method foo at the head of the method, your code will be injected and executed at the start of the method. 
If you specify tail, it will be executed at the end of the method. And there are lots of other features, like injecting code at each return and many more. So this fabric tutorial is very useful to understand what you can do with mixins. But that doesn't explain the magic. And so on the Discord they told me, read the mixin wiki. And I really recommend you to read it as well. It's very detailed and if you have some general Java development experience, I think you will really enjoy it. The key takeaway from these articles is that mixins are basically class overlays. Mumfrey, the developer of mixins, also said that overlay would be a really good term for it. So what the mixin framework does is it takes our mixin class and then takes the normal existing class and kind of merges them together, overlays them basically. And that's not just good imagination, that's actually what it does. It merges the code of the original class with the code of our overlay class or mixing class. And so now we need to understand how that is done. How is the code merged? And this is not done on the source code level. Maybe you remember from last episode where we explored Minecraft servers. They decompile the server code and apply patches. So they actually modify the text source code. And here in the Minecraft client, it's not like our text is copied into the real class and then compiled. Mixins don't decompile and recompile the client. The magic lies in the OW2 ASM dependency. ASM is an all-purpose Java bytecode manipulation and analysis framework. I had a bit of trouble understanding how ASM is used, but then I stumbled over this university lecture by Fred Überlauf. First of all, amazing name, Überlauf is a German translation for overflow. I guess you understand why I say amazing name. Anyway, this class recording was very well done. Unfortunately, it's in German, so for many of you, not that great, but maybe you can work with the auto translation of YouTube or just look at the code itself. Also, I couldn't figure out which university this is, but shout out to this one, you seem to have great teachers. Anyway, in the video, he was using ASM to basically craft a Java class by hand. And of course, not the text source code of a class, but the actual compiled bytecode for the JVM. That's what ASM can do. You can write code like this and ASM will generate the bytecode for it. And then you can actually use a class loader to load the class from the raw bytecode. And seeing this in a practical example from this lecture, suddenly it all makes sense for me how mixins are implemented. Simply speaking, they take the existing Java bytecode of a Minecraft class and thanks to ASM they can manipulate this bytecode and merge the code of your mixin into it at the positions you defined. This was very oversimplified, there are lots of challenges to overcome in the actual implementation. For example, Minecraft classes are obfuscated, remember that? So when you write your mixin, it also has to use the obfuscation mappings to find the actual obfuscated class to apply your code to. But it makes sense how it kind of works, right? Beautiful design, I think. But there's one last missing puzzle piece that I didn't understand. And that was, okay, you have now your modified class. How do you get Minecraft to use your modified class? Do you somehow override it in memory? Turns out it's not really all written. I guess this is my wrong imagination coming from the binary world where you patch code in the game's memory. In the Java world, that's not necessary. And so this is where Fabric comes into play, the Fabric Loader. Basically, they modified the class loader. And by changing the class loader of Minecraft, they can basically force other classes to be loaded, the modified classes. Classes belonging to Minecraft are loaded with a class loader that applies transformations to classes before they are loaded. And now I feel like everything makes sense. By the way, I want to mention, not to confuse everybody, not every mod works through mixins. If I understand it correctly, mixins are a more recent development in the way how mods can be developed. So each Minecraft modding framework has different ways to do it. And of course, there's also historical baggage and backwards compatibility and so forth. But to me as an outsider, and I hope I don't step on anybody's toes here, I think mixins are a really beautiful design and I think the code makes total sense. I think it's very easy to think of just overlaying the classes. So I think for developers it makes sense. 
It is also very powerful. You have a lot of freedom and control over where you want to inject your code into in Minecraft. And of course, the technical implementation through modifying the bytecode is awesome too. It's just mind blowing. I don't know what else to say. Now, maybe you ask yourself again, what does this have to do with hacking? We just learned how to develop Minecraft mods. Well, don't you think ASM is useful for hacking? For example, in 2018, Ian Haken, senior security software engineer at Netflix, presented his work about automated discovery of deserialization gadget chains. He developed this tool, Gadget Inspector. This project inspects Java libraries and class paths for gadget chains. Gadget chains are used to construct exploits for deserialization vulnerabilities. And guess what? How is that implemented? Gadget Inspector primarily utilizes the ASM library for Java bytecode inspection and builds upon its instruction visitor framework to perform symbolic execution. And to be honest, a lot about Java deserialization vulnerabilities are still a bit of a mysterium to me. But thanks to Minecraft mods, learning about how they are implemented, they lead me to a university class where they craft Java classes with ASM, so helping me understand how ASM can be used. And now I can connect the dots to research about Java deserialization exploits. That's how I learn stuff. And that's why I love doing this. All right, our inventory is full. I really want to get back to bring what we found to safety. And not sure if you noticed, I got lost and didn't know how to get back. So I just decided to dig to the surface. We were actually really close, but it was night and so there were still monsters around. And holy crap, so this is how the bedrock prison looked like? Okay, looks evil. Let's check it out. Interesting design, I would say. But hey, look over there. Those were materials we found, for example, in the jungle, but I thought we lost them when we died. Looks like whoever imprisoned us was actually nice, collected some of the items and planted some trees and bamboo for us. That's a nice surprise.